Good morning. Thank you to the uh, praise team. Singing was good today, wasn't it? Boy, I mean, y'all were lifting it up. It was really good. And thank them for getting here every Sunday. They're here earlier, and, and they're practicing, and, and, and y'all joined in. Today was a great day for singing. That, that, that lifted me up. I, I don't need to hear a preacher today, so, you know. I've heard him before. Y'all ever heard him? I have. Well, today we're talking about trust. Uh, you may have caught on that, that it's trust. It, in about uh, 1620, some Puritans came over from England. Now, originally the uh, Church of England had split from the Catholic Church, and then the Puritans split from the Church of England, and they came here for religious liberty, freedom, lack of persecution, and a little bit of financial opportunity. Uh, well, it's about 150 years after that or so, when we started getting ready for the U.S. Constitution, which is still a declaration of some faith in God. And it's years after that when we start printing money, and our money says, in God we trust. Folks, that's got to be true. Now, I don't know completely how true that is of all of our nation anymore, but that's got to be true of the church. That's got to be one of our defining characteristics is that we trust God. Well, what is trust? Trust is a firm conviction in a, in, in, a, in a person's reliability, in their ability, a firm conviction that their word is truth, that they always keep their word, and a firm conviction in their strength and their ability to help you in times of need. That is what trust really is, and that's a pretty good definition of our relationship with God. And boy, that's easy in good times, isn't it? When everything's flowing good, you got a new car, the house is warm, and, and you got plenty to eat, man, it's easy to trust God, isn't it? Uh, but when life falls apart, that's when you need to trust more than ever. But that's when it's hardest to trust, isn't it? Well, here's the truth. Trust requires relationship. Now, I want us to get that in our cards. Trust requires relationship. The more of a relationship you have, the easier it is to trust. Now, when, when is it harder to trust, hardest to trust for you? Now, that's not a rhetorical question. I'm asking for answers. When do you find it the hardest to trust? When you've made a mistake. Oh, that's a good answer, Mark. Thank you. When, when's it hard to trust? <laughs> When things aren't getting any better, when you're praying your brains out, you're praying your heart out, and things don't seem to be coming the way you want them to come. Somebody else, give me one more. When's it hard to trust? Oh, and loss. Seeing someone suffer like Sean is suffering and others are suffering right now, it makes it so hard to trust. You know, it was a few years ago now uh, when I went in for that heart catheterization, and that's a little bit of a nerve-wracking situation when they say, we're going to stick a wire in your groin, and it's okay, that's, that's bad enough. We're going to cut a hole in a great big vein, and we're going to run that wire through your body. See, that, they make that sound so easy. We're just going to stick that wire right up there up into your heart, and I'm thinking, wait a second. What if you take the wrong turn somewhere in Albuquerque, and you end up in my toe or something, or you're looking out my ear or something? I mean, that's easy for them to say, and, and I don't know the guy that's going to do this thing. I mean, I'm going in there, and they strap you to that table, and they put your arms in these little two-by-four things, and so you're like this, and the, the board on your back feels like it's about that wide, and they didn't knock me completely out, and I kept asking them, would you please knock me all the way out? And they kept saying, well, we've given you enough for a horse. And so, you know, I was scared smooth to death because I didn't really trust them. The only thing that got me through that is I did really trust God. So I knew if I die out here like crucified, it's all right, I'm going to go to heaven, so it'll be okay. But I didn't really trust them. You see, here's the thing about trusting God. And I want you to listen to this because it's tough language. When you trust God, God becomes responsible. Now some will say, well, you mean trust means I'm irresponsible. Don't hear me saying that. I'm not saying go out and sit in your lawn chair and trust that God's going to mow your grass. That's, that's not what I'm saying. You've got to mow your grass, but you trust God to bring the rain that's going to bring the grass next time, and you don't worry too much if you miss this spot. Trust in God means God is now responsible. He's taken over. That means God is in charge of the details. And if God's in charge of the details, guess who's not? 
you. And if God's in charge of the details when you trust him, that means God is also in charge and responsible for the outcomes. If you are not going to trust God, well, that means you're responsible for everything that happens, you're responsible for every detail, and you're responsible for every outcome. And now, how's that work out for you? That works out laying on a table with having somebody stick a probe up into your heart because, because of stress and stuff like that, and you end up stressed, no peace, no joy, no nothing. It just destroys you. But it's hard. Isn't it easier to talk about than do? I mean, man, I, I'm a fixer. How, how, how many of you are fixers, especially fellas? How many of you are fixers? You know, I listen to Melissa say things, and my first instinct is I'm going to fix it. And she says, I don't want you to fix it, I just want you to listen. Well, I'm sorry, you just want me to listen, and I'm going crazy. Because in my DNA, I'm a fixer. Well, that means you don't respect me. No, it doesn't mean I don't respect you. It means I'm nuts, and I can't help myself uh, because I'm a fixer in my heart. And I kind of like control. Any of y'all kind of like being in control? Well, i got news for you, you're not. <laughs> Even if you think you are, you're not. You've got to give that up. You've got to give up the need to fix and the need to control, and you've got to trust God with all that stuff. And a lot of my marriage counseling, especially in the last few years, I've gotten ready where I don't spend a lot of time going over the psychology of stuff. I've gotten where all I say to people is, because the truth in marriage is, you're never fighting what you think you're fighting about. Ever. The topic you're fighting over is not the problem. You're, you're, you're arguing about respect or trust or some other issue, and you just got a symptom, and we're destroying our marriages over symptoms. And I've got more and more and more in marriage counseling when all I say is, you made a commitment when you married this person, so you get on your knees and you grab a towel and you wash their feet and you serve them the way you promised to when you married them, and you trust God with their reaction. And every time I tell a couple to do that, I'm telling you, in the last few years it's been breathtaking how many men and women will call me and say, when I finally just trusted God and poured myself out for this individual and quit fighting all the time, they responded and we are now closer than we've ever been in our entire married life. But you've got to trust God. You've got to trust God with your kids. Man, that's hard. That's hard. I want to tell this boy what to do. I want to control sometimes, and I want to fix things. But you've got to give your kids to God. That's the only way you're ever going to find any peace. And so at some point, you've got to get in your mind and say, if God's willing to watch them do this, I guess I better be willing to watch them do this too. And just let God be in control. Proverbs chapter 3 says, Trust God with, trust in the Lord with a little bit of your heart. Trust in the Lord with Stick your big toe in the water and see if it's warm. Trust in the Lord with, everybody say all. All your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your understanding. See, when you're going to lean on something, you've got to know something. If I'm going to lean on something, what I need to know? That it ain't going to fall over. That's right. I want to make sure what I'm leaning on is solid. And the fact of the matter is our understanding is never going to be solid. So lean on the Lord, uh, not on your own understanding, but lean on him. Uh, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Don't do that. That's going to get you in trouble. Uh, in all your ways, honor God or submit to God, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Don't be wise in your own eyes, but fear God and run from evil. Now, what did he say? Fear God and do what with evil? Don't play with it. Don't peddle with it. And some of that's trying to be in control and trust in yourself. Fear God and run from evil, and that will bring you health and strengthen your bones. And then he goes ahead and says in Proverbs chapter 3, Honor God with your money. Give him the first fruit of your crops. And here's the promise. See, this is saying even trust God with your wallet. Trust God with your checkbook. Honor God with your money. And here's what he'll do. He will fill up your barn. And he will fill up your vat with new wine. Trust God with your money. And watch what he does. 
Trust God with all your heart. So here's the thing. Can you really relax? Yeah. Yeah, so hard for some of us to do. Because we feel like when we relax, we're not, we're not being in, in control. We're not being responsible. We're not doing what we ought to be doing. Ought to, I, ought, to, I ought to be meeting God halfway. No, you relax. Do the thing you're supposed to do as a, as a husband, as a wife, as an employee, as a Christian. But relax. Because here's the point of trust. In a relationship, you're either growing in trust or you're going to leave. You know why most people leave the Lord or leave church attendance and those kind of things? The bottom line is lack of trust. Most people leave because of a lack of trust. And we like to think our motives are pristine. No. In relationships, you're either growing in trust or you'll leave. If there's no trust in a relationship, you either have to repair it or leave it. Now, how many of us have lost friends in our lives? because we lost trust in our friend. Or, unfortunately, sometimes they lose trust in us. Now, unfortunately, I've had friends that, that I've lost trust in, and I've had friends lose trust in me, and I probably deserve that. How many marriages have been lost because people quit, cease to trust each other in their marriage? How many marriages have been lost because of, uh, of infidelity, sexual immorality? And that's the only time Jesus said, that one doesn't even require forgiveness. You can... That one I get, you know, when somebody breaks it, that sexual moral code, you man, you've broken trust in a way that that may not be able to be put back together. Now, often it is, very often it is, through forgiveness. But once somebody's been unfaithful, hmm, trust is hard to build. But here's the thing. Ready? God will never be unfaithful to you. God will never cheat on you. God will never take his eyes off of you. God will never be unaware of you. God will always meet your needs. But for some folks, that, that trust is so hard to believe. For a lot of us, there's, just this, there's this underlying thought that if I completely trust you, sometime you're going to hurt me. And people do sometimes. When I work with these kids across the state of Texas, the hardest thing to build is trust. Got a kid I worked with that that uh, she was with an abusive uh, stepdad. And it wasn't uncommon for him to get mad and take out a, a gun and just empty a clip of bullets. And they would run from the house and just wait for the, uh, the till they knew how many bullets were in the clip. And they'd count. And they'd come home. Now imagine what that does to a kid. And then one day, <coughs> the same individual walked in at a family gathering killed her grandmother, two uncles, and a brother, and wounded several others. You think she doesn't have trust issues? And the hardest thing for me to get past with that kid is, I'm not going to hurt you. You can trust me. And you know what? A lot of us never find our Christian joy that, he, that we're intended to have because we've got this one little thing or two little things that hold us back from fully trusting God. And so we never get that peace. We never get that joy that God really wants us to experience. Because in our heart of hearts, some of us, and all of us at times, start thinking, we would never say it, but we start thinking, man, if I do what I'm called to do as a Christian, I'm going to get hurt. Man, if I sacrifice the way Jesus said sacrifice, if I really take up my cross and follow him, I'm not sure that's going to work out for me. If I give everything I got to feed the poor, if, if, if I sacrifice more, if I commit more, if I work more, if I give more, I'm not sure my life's going to be the way I want it to be. And so we hold back. And we never find it. And so at church, we go through the motions. We take our communion and we sing our songs and we have our prayers and, and we punch our cards, but we never find that peace, that contentment that comes from just falling back in God's arms. How many of you like Christmas movies? Yeah, every, every Christmas season we watch all the movies. Boy, we got our rotation of all the movies we watch. And among those are the Santa Claus movies with Tim Allen. Any of y'all watch those? The Santa Claus, one, two, and three. I don't like the one with Jack Frost, uh, but I like the first two, but we suffer through the third one because you got it. That's the rule. 
But the first two, when, when Tim Allen first figures out he's Santa Claus, and he goes to the North Pole and he thinks he's having a dream, okay? Uh, and, and the little elf, the little girl that makes him the, the hot cocoa that took her a thousand years to perfect the recipe, shaken, not stirred, uh, and he's just saying, I know I'm imagining this. There's a polar bear directing traffic down there. And he says, I just can't believe this. And the little elf girl says this. Seeing is not believing. Believing is seeing. And in the second one, when Santa Claus has to get married because the Santa Claus says, after a year, you've got to be a married Santa Claus or you can't stay, he's got to go get married. And he falls in love with the evil principal at his son's uh, high school, and she doesn't believe, and, and the, the son shows her the snow globe, and she says the same thing, and he quotes the elf and says, seeing is not believing. Believing is seeing. And you know what we do to God sometimes with trust? We put him on this cycle of proof. Well, you just prove this, I'll believe. You just do that, I'll believe. If you answer this prayer, I'll believe. If you do that miracle, I'll believe. If you make everybody at church speak to me, I'll believe. If I put the fleece out and it comes out wet, I'll believe. If I put the wet fleece out and it comes out dry, I'll believe. And we put God through all these paces saying, if I can just see, I'll believe. Well, how much more do you have to see than a cross? The Son of God dying on a cross. Believing is seeing. And if you believe in God and give you, and with all your heart and commit, dive in, then you'll experience the fidelity of God and the love of God. Psalm 34, 8 says this, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Try them out. Dive in. But you see, the devil's got a lot of games out there, doesn't he? Man, that devil's tricky. The devil will make you do things like when somebody gets sick, you'll think, well, God's not listening to my prayers. God must not care about me. The devil will make you think, well, God took my job away, or God, I got fired at work. God, you know, God let that happen to me. Uh, things aren't going my way. I just can't find happiness right now. And the devil will trick you into believing that trust in God is foolishness. And that's exactly why I played you that song today by Lauren Daigle, because I wanted you to hear it, because when he doesn't move a mountain, many of us ask God to move a mountain, and, we, and he doesn't move it, so we say, well, maybe God, maybe I can't trust God. Yes, you can. You probably don't need that mountain moved. And if he moves that mountain, it's not going to be good for you. When God doesn't split the ocean, trust him. You don't need to go to the other side. You need to stay right where you're at right now. When God doesn't give me an answer or the answer you want, you didn't need that answer. You need another answer. Get quiet, trust, and listen to what your Father has to say to you. And arrive at that point in, in Psalm 46. Here's what Psalm 46 says, I think verse 2. If the earth caves in, I will not fear. I will not fear if the earth caves in. If the mountains fall into the sea, if the, if the sea gets so violent that it's nothing but foam and it's shaking the roots of the mountains, I will not fear. So here's what we've got to ask ourselves. Can you trust Jesus? Is Jesus worth trusting with everything? Or is Dr. Phil better? Or Dr. Oz got all them diets? Who are you going to trust? Are you going to trust Sean Hannity, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, AOC, Ted Cruz? Who can you trust? Jesus. He is the one you trust. You've got to ask yourselves when you want to trust, would Jesus ever hurt you? The one that put children on his lap and said, let the little children come to me. The one that would stop with a woman at the well and spend the afternoon with her when he's got places to go. The one would touch a leper somewhere along the line. The one that had the patience with, with his apostles for three and a half years. And the one that would hang on a cross even though he's God. Would he ever hurt you? You see, folks, trust is an active thing. How many of us have kids? 
Remember when we're trying to teach our kids to swim and we're in the swimming pool and you're a foot and a half away from the side of the pool and they got their little water wings on and they couldn't drown if they wanted to. I mean, there's no way. And so they got their little water wings on and you're trying to get them confident in the swimming pool. And so you're sitting there saying, jump, baby, just jump. I'm going to catch you. And they're going, what? Mm. And they kind of lean over and fall back. And then they, I'm going to do it. I'm gonna, here they come. Mm-mm. And it takes them forever. And you're getting for I told you just jump. You ain't going to drown. Well, I love you. I, well, your mama gave birth to you. I was standing there and watch. Why would I let you just jump? I mean, you're going crazy. And they're not going to jump because they don't trust that they're not going to die in that water. And then finally they get their nerve up and they jump. And you catch them if you're a good parent. <laughs> and as soon as you catch them, what do they do? Do it again. Can I do it again? And then they just can't go enough, man. It's like, now you're worn out. Can I please go inside? I am so stinking tired of catching you. But they just want to do it over and over and over. Faith is active, and that's what trust is. Just trust him. Just jump off that ledge, and he's going to catch you, and he's going to take care of you, and he's going to bless you, and he's going to give you health, and he's going to give you strength, and he's going to fill up your barns, and you're going to want to keep on jumping. But believing is seeing. You've got to trust him. He's, a, he's been there waiting all along. It's not always easy, though. Remember the old game where you uh, you go to summer camp? This was always at summer camp you do this. When you somebody falls backwards, they close their eyes and hold their arms out, and there's someone behind them, and you're supposed to say, uh, you know, the, the person behind you is supposed to be playing the role of Jesus. And so they say, John, do you trust me? I trust you, Jesus. And so you fall backwards, straight back, and they catch you. Now, that's kind of hard, isn't it? But they catch you, they got their arms, they don't let you fall all the way if you're heavy because they won't have that strength. So they're close enough to you, they catch you. And then they say, turn around. And here's the tough part. John, do you love me? See, you're facing me now. And and the guy, and the one that you've caught says, oh good, we're going to do it forward? Mm Mm-mm. You stop. You love me? Oh, Jesus, I love you. Fall back. That's what it feels like sometimes, doesn't it? But he's there. Believing is seeing. And it's not blind faith. He's proven himself. It's not blind trust. You see, why do I trust God? Because he made everything. He's creator. Because he split the ocean. I trust God because he led Abraham. And he made a mighty nation out of Abraham. I, I trust him because he, he, he led, uh, led the Israelites through the desert. He made them a mighty nation, and, and he had the prophets, and he wrote the word of God that has always been true and has never one time let me down. Why do I trust God? Because he came to earth. He left heaven, took fleshly form, became a man, and dwelt among us and taught us how we ought to live. Why do I trust God? Because he, he lived and he showed us how to live life, and then he hung on a cross. Why do I trust him? Because death could not destroy him. They hung him, they stuck him in a tomb, and three days later he was back. Why do I trust him? Because he was resurrected, and they watched him float off into heaven, and right now he's he's enthroned on the right-hand side of God, and he's reclaimed his glory, and angels are singing around him, holy, holy, holy. Why do I trust God? Because Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and he's proven that he is, and he said, I'm coming back to get you one of these days, and he's never done me harm. And I believe in him, and I'm going to trust him. And when life doesn't go my way, it's going his way. And that's all that really matters. Because the bottom line is, we either win here or we win there. And either way, it's a victory. Let's pray. Father, trust is so hard for us sometimes because we want to see. But we need to believe. You've given us every reason to believe. You've given us every proof to believe. And so, Father, help us trust you in good times and in bad. When we win and when we lose, help us know that you've got a plan and that you are in all, above all, and over all, that you're King of kings and Lord of lords. And we just need to align ourselves with you, praise you at every moment, 
to give you responsibility, to give you responsibility over details, to give you responsibility over outcomes, to get ourselves out of the way, to obey you in our lives, do what we're supposed to do, and then just relax. In Jesus' name. Oh, we die with gratitude. Anybody ever heard that expression? It was really a slogan that came out of China in 1966. And to this day, Christianity has not been totally destroyed in China. It keeps coming back and coming back. You think schools are sometimes difficult over here? In this true story, two teenage girls are arrested in school. You know what they're arrested for? For teaching that Jesus Christ, Daryl, is the Son of God. Teaching them how to be Christians. And one girl was teaching her friend about this, and the other girl became a Christian too. They were immediately arrested, taken to the local jail, and sentenced to die in two weeks. And what a strange way they had for the prosecution. They called the preacher who had taught them about Jesus Christ, taught the first one, and asked him to come up and do the executing. They told the preacher if he killed the two girls, he would be allowed to continue preaching in his congregation, a house church, week after week. He would not be harmed in anyway. Well, the day came. All the kids at school are there. Their parents are there. And the two girls are there. The preacher is there holding a pistol. And he's going to execute the girls. And the girls say this expression to him. They said, we die with gratitude. And in God we trust. We die with gratitude. And they both gave testimonies before all the students, before all the teachers, to that preacher, thanking him. He's about to kill them. Thanking him for teaching them about Jesus Christ and how to follow him. And said these words. And then the preacher, when they conclude that, shoots both of them and they're dead right there. And the communists then kill the preacher right there. And the word spread all over China. That slogan, that cry that continues to this day, we die with gratitude, but in God we trust. Father, thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit. Thank you for the power of Christ and Christianity. Father, there's been nations and countries and people that's tried to stamp you out. But in God you trust. In Jesus' name, amen.